it was with sheer delight because I knew he'd completely put his foot in it and I knew what he'd done. He'd actually emboldened lots of people. You know, if the idiots that have got us into Europe, if the idiots that have given us open door immigration, if the idiots that have basically bankrupted this country and are leading our national debt to increasing by a staggering 10% per annum, if these, if these idiots are prepared to call UKIP a bunch of clowns, it'll harden our resolve to go out and vote for them. So thank you, Ken Clark. I will be inviting him to speak at the UKIP annual conference in September in London. <laughs> and perhaps we ought to institute an annual Kenneth Clark Prize for contributions towards getting back the British nation state. Who knows? Maybe in the future we'll learn that actually he was one of the cleverest double agents ever. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but that wasn't good enough. Just denouncing us as clowns wasn't good enough. No, the absolute hatred of the professional political class. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a group of people who now sit on the front benches for the Labour, Liberal Democrat and Conservative parties, who have nearly all been to less than a handful of schools, who have then gone on to no more than two Oxford colleges, who have all studied PPE, and who have all gone straight from Oxford University into a research office, and none of them have ever done a day's work in their lives. They look the same, they sound the same, you can't put a cigarette paper between them on issues of major substance, they marry each other's sisters, <laughs> they spend their weekends together, they have no hobbies, they have no interests, their whole life is about politics and their whole life is about climbing up the greasy pole and they care more about their own political ambitions than they do about the welfare of this country and the people within it. And that is why I think UKIP is striking a chord. We're striking a chord because clearly we're a party made up of ordinary men and women from a wide range of backgrounds, but all of us have had a job and done something and contributed something towards this country. We're doing well because we've actually got a policy platform. I know Nigel's been going through some of it already. We've got a policy platform that is based on common sense and is based on putting the interests of Britain first and of standing up for this country and of saying we will not betray the memory of our grandparents' generation who went to war to make sure that we could be a free democratic country. <laughs> so I think we really have struck the most amazing chord. Now, those in the uh, political class have been so astonished that many of their own supporters have switched to us that the attack has now changed. So rather than Clark lambasting UKIP, no, what Downing Street have chosen to do is they've decided to lambast their own people. Brilliant, isn't it? Isn't Dave a wonderful Tory party leader? He is for me anyway. <laughs> and they have decided to say that their own constituency associations, their own activists, their own members, their own supporters, their own councillors, their own voters, their own donors, their own door knockers, their own leaflet stuffers, they've decided that those people who are concerned about the European question, who think we should get a grip on open door immigration, who think the wind energy project is probably the biggest scam we've seen in our lifetimes, and people who think that gay marriage is absolutely not a priority for a country that is virtually bankrupt, they have decided to denounce them as swivel-eyed loons. <laughs> it, is, it is totally astonishing, isn't it? And this is because we've got this professional career political class and they actually hold the views, ladies and gentlemen, of people like you in total and utter contempt. It is remarkable. Um, and I must say uh, that, that Cameron's mob behaving like that and Miliband now saying that he doesn't think, basically, that the British people are intelligent enough to vote in a European referendum to decide their future 
and with the Lib Dems collapsing under Nick Clegg, I think that it would be quite wrong to denounce the vote that UKIP got on May the 2nd as being, you know, you've heard it before, a protest vote. Yeah? If they really want to be rude, they say it's just a protest vote. And I first heard this the morning after the Eastley by-election. And we went to the office, we were walking up the high street, it was about nine o'clock in the morning. I wasn't necessarily feeling my best, I've got to tell you. Um, and as we walked up the street, you know, I met shoppers. I met men and women shopping who said, Mr Farage, we've just seen on the news that we're protest voters. Oh no, we're not protest voters, they said. We voted for UKIP because we believe in absolutely every word you say and you speak for me. It is not a protest vote. And these millions of people are not just going to gravitate straight back towards the Labour Party or towards the, or towards the, you want to get a grip, you want to get a grip. Dear, 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 oh dear. Oh, this is quite a spectacle, isn't it? Actually, it's worth looking at this one, it really is. No, this is something else, I've got to tell you. Dear, dear, dear. They must be putting something in their tea, that's all I can say. No, and, 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 and really, I think the political weather in this country has changed, and what we're now going to do is we're going to build on those successes, we're going to build the membership of this party, we're going to build the calibre of our candidates, and next year, next year, we have a European election. It'll probably take place on May the 22nd, uh, and my aim and ambition is to say to voters from every party in this country, you have been denied for far too long an opportunity to have a say on the greatest constitutional question that this country has faced in 300 years. You've been promised referendums by everybody at election after election. Indeed, Dave Cameron even gave you a cast iron guarantee that if he was Prime Minister, there'd be a referendum. And now is your chance in the European elections of 2014 to put behind you any previous tribal ties to any political party and to put the interests of the country before your normal political party. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, with the help and support and encouragement of people like you up and down the length and breadth of this land, that we have an opportunity on May the 22nd next year in the European elections for UKIP to top the poll nationally and to cause an earthquake in British politics. And so my message to you tonight, and we'll, you know, we'll go through more policy and questions and perhaps more speculation about the future, but my message to you tonight, um, and I wonder, let's just have a, have a little test here. How many people in the room, hands up, are not members of UKIP? Goodness me, would you lock that door? <laughs> <coughs> no, I promise you there's no press gang here. Um, but well over half of you are not members of UKIP, but you've come along tonight to listen to what we've got to say. And I want to say this to you. The members can ignore me for the moment. Um, but I want to say this to you. You know, if you agree with what we stand for, if you agree with what we're trying to do, then I want you to do something that the English don't often do. I want you to stop watching the news at 10 and moaning about it and cursing perhaps under your breath at it and saying to yourself, isn't this awful? What's happened to our country? I want you to do something that the English traditionally have never been very good at doing until it came to the very 11th hour. I want you to stand up and to do something because together, if we get all of us that believe in this, if we get all of us that are determined to hand on to our children and grandchildren the freedoms and liberties that we've enjoyed, if we get everyone together and we fight towards that goal and we're prepared to give a couple of pounds and perhaps to expend a little bit of shoe leather, then, ladies and gentlemen, between us, we can get our country back. And that is what I've dedicated my life towards doing, and we are going to win. Thank you. Well done. Excellent. Thank you, Nigel. That's all right. Brilliant. Good. Explain, please, why the mainstream media since 1954 
have never reported on the meeting of the Bilderberg Group, whom are meeting this coming weekend in Watford, and who have been one of the most powerful influences behind the formation of the European Union, and what UKIP have done and are doing to expose them to the general public. Okay. I think that I think one of the problems uh, with any form of status quo is that the politicians, the media, the civil service, and the giant multinational companies, uh, frankly, are all swimming in the same pool. They've almost become interchangeable, haven't they? You know, the number of people who were politicians who become bureaucrats or European commissioners and vice versa. Um, and so I think the media um, have tended to be uncritical um, of some of this stuff, and they've tended to accept the basic line that was put since the 1950s that there was a high ideal behind the European project. And so, you know, people that met, whether it's at Bilderberg Group or elsewhere, were genuine in the 1950s in their desire to do something to try and stop the Germans smashing hell out of the French once every 25 years or so. Because that's the reality, isn't it? You know, three times in 70 years, the Germans invaded France, twice leading to huge global conflagrations and the death of 100 million people. So just as communism, when it was set up and they brought the Tsar down in 1917, just as that was well-intentioned, because people believed they were going to make the world a fairer place, in fact it made it even less fair than it had been before, uh, there was a high ideal behind the European Union and nobody dared to question it. And the reality is that time has gone on, it, far from being a project that brings people together round the table to have a glass of wine and be friends, what's actually happening is that against their will, the peoples of Europe are being forced together into a political union without anybody ever having given their consent. And when people vote no, in referendums, like the French voted no, they ignored them. The Dutch voted no, they ignored them. Little Ireland voted no and were told, you've got it wrong, you must go and vote again. <laughs> and, and what has actually emerged is a project that is fundamentally anti-democratic in its nature, centrist and communist, actually, in, in terms of its financial planning, economically ruinous in terms of the euro, and thank goodness we didn't listen to Ken Clark, Tony Blair, and all the other idiots that wanted us to join the Euro. Thank goodness we kept the pound. Because if you look, if you look at the economic misery that is now being meted upon the people in the Mediterranean countries, it is damn serious. I mean, very, very worrying. And far from being a project making people love each other, the Germans now hate and resent the Mediterraneans, and the Greeks think that the Germans are, are, are as bad as they were in 1943, and we have a Europe, actually, where people are beginning to dislike each other, and where we see a neo-Nazi party in, in Greece on the rise. So it's failing. And, and I think now, sir, the cosy consensus that existed, and the basic belief that even though the European project had its problems, it was a force for good, I think all that has changed in British politics, and the reason that it's changed in British politics is because a small, new, little, much derided political party came along and said, the emperor has got no clothes. Uh, like a, a number of people who have worked overseas for many years, uh, I've come back to the UK with a wife who is not from the Commonwealth and not from the EU. Now, the difficulty that I have in getting her firstly into the country and secondly getting citizenship for her, you would not believe. Now, I'm not the only person in yeah. this situation as funding the group of us. Is there any prospect that the party would do anything for people in this situation? You know, whatever immigration policy you have, you will always find cases that look to be unfair. But there is a basic principle, sir. There is a basic principle that I want us to have ongoing with our immigration policy, and I'll give it to you as the answer to your question. We ran a policy from the early 1950s, you know, Windrush and all the rest of it, we ran a policy from the early 1950s up until Mr Blair got into power, where we had a managed migration into Britain of between 30 and 50,000 people a year. 
predominantly from the Commonwealth. 